this guy's garage. Like and subscribe. First of all, Mr. Jacob Suzla, who is a correctional officer uh, federally, and also Mr. Michael Wagner, who is online with us today. He's a professor and William T. Uh, Evju, distinguished chair for the Wisconsin IDEA from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Now, Mr. Susley, just, just to be clear here, you're representing yourself. You're not representing your union or anything like that. That's correct? That's correct. <clears throat> I'm going to run a few scenarios by you, but before we do that, what I'd like to delve into is the culture of the Correctional Service of Canada. Now, the Correctional Service of Canada reports to parliamentarians through the Minister of Justice and is accountable. In fact, we have the Commissioner up here at committee. So when we're talking about misinformation and disinformation, particularly as it relates to parliamentarians, um, in my view, this is actually quite germane. Would you say that CSE has a, what I would call, these are my words, a, a, a culture of secrecy? Um, what would you say about that? I think that would be a fair statement to make. And can you elaborate on, on what you've seen generally? We don't want you to breach any confidentiality or anything like that. But the culture of secrecy, how does that manifest itself? What are the consequences? My experience has been that the service is inclined to answer the questions to the bare minimum to not expose themselves to anything that would portray them in a, in a way that, that uh, is counter to how they want to be looked at by parliamentarians and by the public. How do they want to be looked at, in your view, by parliamentarians and the public? In my view, they, they want to be regarded as progressive, as... Uh, uh, I think they would very much prefer, to be honest, to be left out of most any spotlight they can, but but certainly to be viewed as a, as a progressive organization that is on the uh, forefront of, of changing the perception of corrections. How does CSC deal with anything negative? <laughs> In my experience, um, they don't, or by quickly clamping down on those who are drawing attention to any negativity. So in those situations, if we as Parliament are trying to evaluate how well our correctional system is operating, I mean, this is just a comment, it seems like <clears throat> we don't get the unvarnished truth. Now, I'm not going to ask you to comment on this specific scenario, but um, I did uh, some work, um, and I believe I produced a video on it, wherein the Correctional Service of Canada put out a press release after somebody escaped. And the escape said the person escaped from institutional property. The person was on minimum in medium security. For those who don't know, that's two very large fences surrounding the institution. The same as maximum, in fact. Um, very difficult to escape from. And the service put out a bulletin saying he escaped from the grounds of, minimum, of medium security. Sounds fine, right? But the information I had was that this person was actually allowed to be outside the fence. That was a pretty material omission, in my view. If you're going to say someone escaped from medium security, I picture them jumping over two razor wire fences that are about 20 feet apart and are about 12 feet high. Uh, that's a pretty material omission, kind of like we sometimes see in Parliament tell half the truth, and that's true. He was on the grounds. Um, can you comment, not specifically on this case, but whether this type of thing is a surprise, given your experience? In my experience, that is absolutely no surprise. Um, those are more common than I think most people would ever believe. And would, in that case, this service be trying to, I'm just inferring, that doesn't want to say this person was actually outside of the fence? You don't have to answer that, I'm just saying. It just seems they don't want to acknowledge this person was outside of the perimeter fence and they simply walked away. And yet, we as parliamentarians and the public get the half-truth. I also exposed... Paul Bernardo and his situation and and I said to the public and I said very clearly I came eye to eye with that offender and CSC came out and were quoted that I had no interactions with that inmate and yet I hadn't said I had any interactions but they framed it as though I was lying about it does that type of reaction from CSC surprise you given your given your um, experience <clears throat> 
based on my experience, that doesn't surprise me at all. Now, needle exchange. Jail has an underground economy, is that correct? Yes. Value, right? Drugs, weapons, any information, cell phones, everything has value, is that right? That's correct. It's, uh, we, we phrase it, that's, that's what makes jail go round, is that underground economy. Two please down. It, wait, I have, um, I have just... Oh. Point d'ordre. Point of order, Mr. Chair. Pardon, Mr. President, j'ai, j'ai un peu de... Apologies. I don't see the link to disinformation for parliamentarians here. This seems to be completely off topic. Thank you for your comment, Mr. Villemur. The study is on disinformation and misinformation and the impact on parliamentarians. I believe that Mr. Caputo will bring his questions back to our study. Go ahead, please. Uh, uh, candidly, that uh, we're talking about how a government agency communicates with the public and parliamentarians. I don't know what could be more germane to misinformation and disinformation. So I will move forward. The government has told, has spoken with parliamentarians and the public about needle exchanges. Has, has, what kind of picture have they painted about needle exchanges? And I've got about 10, 20, if you can answer that in about 15 seconds, please. That it's a harm reduction measure. What kind of danger are you seeing, and is that being communicated to parliamentarians? I don't believe that's being accurately communicated at all. The dangers we're seeing is the introduction of weapons into the into the facilities and and, and the, the feeding of this underground economy, where we're creating elements to the economy that we haven't dealt with before. Okay. Your retribution. Mr. Caputo, uh, oh. we're out of time. Okay. It's been a while where the Conservative Party leader has been attacking mainstream media and journalists with the intention to mislead and make Canadians believe that the news networks they have trusted before for, uh, for many, many years are no longer trustworthy. Can you perhaps comment on the dangers that this presents to the state of Canada's information ecosystem and to our democracy? Sure. Um, there's a, a long line uh, of research uh, in the study of political communication that um, what uh, researchers call blaming the referees uh, is um, is a strategy often that that uh, political elites can use to try to to diminish trust uh, in in verifiably accurate news sources. And so there's a distinction to be made between um, news sources uh, that. Uh, have things like corrections policies and punish journalists when they get facts wrong versus uh, other uh, organizations that um, also sometimes frame themselves as being news organizations but are primarily opinion uh, organizations. Um, and so when it comes to the, the more trusted places, the places where they're engaging in what we would think of as more legitimate journalism, which doesn't mean they're always right but means that they correct themselves when they are wrong, um, it's it's a danger to diminish trust in those organizations uh, without evidence, um, and a lot of times uh, a strategy uh, that uh, political elites use is to try and diminish the amount of, of trust uh, in uh, mainstream uh, news sources. And the purpose of that diminishing trust is then to not face uh, consequences uh, from voters at the ballot box, as an example, uh, for uh, in, uh, behaviors lawmakers or, or others may engage in. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I I will tack on the the second half of that question to my next question. Now, inflammatory language and material, you spoke about this in your uh, opening remarks as well with respect to uh, emotions getting more engagement than, than facts. And we've seen uh, dog whistles, et cetera, by, um, by political parties generating a lot of uh, engagement and that engagement does lead to, to ad revenue as well. So is it fair to say that media platforms are actually benefiting financially uh, when and if they allow this dissemination of mis- and disinformation uh, on their platforms? I think it's fair to say that social media platforms benefit from that and that some uh, news media platforms benefit from that as well. It, 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 It partially depends upon... 
the major purpose of the platform and why people use it. And so if it's a place where people are trying to learn what's true, there might not be as much of a financial benefit as for those who might seek out a new source because that source tells them that they are right and the other side is wrong. And so th- there are there are advantages um, to following that kind of model, but not for all media in, in a blanket way. I appreciate that. And, and I'll, I'll go back to my, my original question partly. Say, is there any correlation between a person's distrust of mainstream media sources and their participation in the democratic process? And if so, how? There, there is in, in some ways. And so um, people who distrust mainstream sources tend to be more supportive of political violence uh, as uh, an avenue to exact uh, political preferences. Um, Many people who are distrustful of mainstream news sources are also highly participatory. Uh, And in fact, many people who who believe in conspiracy theories are, are extraordinarily knowledgeable and have very low trust in uh, political institutions like mainstream news media sources or or uh, elements of, of, of government. And so um, there, there are lots of different ways that one's distrust of news could foster participation, sometimes encouraging more violence, but often con- encouraging more participation in voting, uh, political donations, posting online, uh, things like that. I appreciate that. Now, I understand, uh, you know, you spoke about this, about the role that um, the Western social media platforms play. Do you think that there is an obligation on on these social media platforms with respect to uh, the algorithms and how information is disseminated, whether it is truthful information or it's misinformation, disinformation, hate speech? Uh, do you think that social media companies have a responsibility to, to control how those algorithms are impacting what an individual Canadian is seeing within their feed and how it's impacting their uh, participation in the democratic process. I think that there are responsibilities that social media platforms have when it comes to the unfettered ampl- amplification of things that are known to be false. Uh, th- those can often be very dangerous and, and have violent uh, consequences uh, or or other consequences that might be political consequences but are related to believing in things that, that are verifiably not true. Uh, much of politics operates in a gray area where some things that are said are true and some things are not. And so it can be dangerous for social media platforms to regulate with too heavy of a hand and stifle speech. Uh, but when it comes to um, de-amplifying statements that are known to be verifiably false, uh, social media platforms have an obligation to, um, in my view, uh, to not to not try to share that information uh, widely uh, with their users. Now, you spoke a little bit about fact checking as um, as a method of of controlling misinformation, disinformation, and and how it's disseminated. And you also talked about the bias as to who exactly is fact checking. Now, I've seen uh, you know a lot of people, some people, uh, if they're uh, sold on an idea. You know, you Google something, you'll find 20 articles countering your idea. All you need to do is to find that one article to confirm um, what Ms. your belief Khalid, is. If you can just quick, uh, Absolutely. Quick. How do you think that uh, plays uh, into what kind of regulations and partnerships governments need to have with social media companies in that dissemination of information? I need a very quick response, please. That's a very difficult question um, to answer because it's very difficult to figure out the the volume there. And so it, it's something that platforms need to discuss uh, with, with regulators, but I, I don't have a quick answer to that question. I'm sorry to say. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, go ahead. Uh, I'm just wondering that uh, if the witness uh, can perhaps think about it and, and give a written response to that question. Uh, I'll deal with that at the end of the meeting like we typically do with those requests. Who could we identify other than Truth Social as being kind of the worst for disinformation? It's it's hard to say with accuracy because we we don't know the denominator of how many posts are made on all of the different platforms as compared to how many things aren't true. My impression is that X has now become that leader, but I, I don't know that as an empirical fact. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur Wagner. Okay, um, Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Thank you, Mr. Villemur. Six minutes. Go ahead, please. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Wagner, can you please state your subject matter expertise on this one more time for the record? 
Sure. Uh, I'm, uh, I have a PhD in political science, uh, and I uh, conduct research um, on individual engagement in information ecologies, and, and including uh, news, uh, social media, and individual conversation, uh, and look at outcomes related to what people uh, believe to be true, uh, what they want from their government, and how they participate uh, civically and politically. Mr. Suzuli, can you please state your subject matter expertise on misinformation and disinformation? I'll state my experience as a correctional officer since 2007 within the federal penitentiary system. So no subject matter expertise on misinformation? Okay. Mr. Wagner, with that being said, um, who are the primary actors spreading misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation? And, and I know you're coming from an American context, but perhaps you might have some uh, insight into the Canadian political system. A, a lot of, of mis- and disinformation that is shared in Western democracies uh, originates uh, from uh, Russian sources in, in the IRA, uh, Internet Research Agency, um, and at their um, uh, bot farms uh, in, in different parts of Europe uh, that uh, exist to kind of sow false claims and, and, and try and spread them. Um, in the American context, um, a key spreader of, of misinformation that also gets a lot of attention uh, is the former president, uh, Donald Trump, um, as, as in terms of an account uh, that spreads a lot of uh, misinformation. Um, but I would say, you know, the, the primary um, organization that is really attempting to influence elections in Canada, in the United States, uh, is, is the Russian uh, IRA. And are certain parliamentarians more at risk than others in being targeted and affected by disinformation campaigns? It seems to be that uh, the IRA uh, or, or, or the Russian uh, government has uh, candidates they would prefer to see win elections and candidates they would prefer to see lose elections. And so those they would prefer to see lose tend to be more uh, more in the more in the to have a greater likelihood of of, of being targeted uh, with negative information, um, although sometimes uh, candidates on in, in different parties get positive and negative information from these agencies uh, as an effort to just sow chaos and be confusing, which is often uh, one of the objectives of, of this kind of organization. Is it fair to say that this goes well beyond Russia? Because it, you know, I would put to you that it's been my experience. We love to oversimplify this as Russian, Chinese, maybe Indian sometimes. But is it not fair to say that uh, there are various state-sponsored internet propaganda machines that are used to spread this? And, you know, I would reference Operation Earnest Voice, and you know, in the United States of America. Um, I would, I would reference, you, you talked about Donald Trump. Obviously, the United States was a prime uh, propagator of the Chinese virus during COVID and a lot of uh, vaccine misinformation, disinformation. There are allies such as, uh, so-called allies such as Israel with the Hasbara. They have a whole ministry of uh, strategic affairs that deals with uh, targeting political actors. And I know that that's kind of come out in the United States. So can you maybe just take a step back and zoom back and talk a little bit more beyond Russia in terms of the state-sponsored internet uh, propaganda machines that are out there? There are lots of um, state-sponsored efforts to try and influence elections in other countries and, and in their own countries. Um, there are lots of non-state sponsored um, uh, organizations that also are trying to do the same and do so by trying to spread uh, mis- and disinformation. So yeah, it's certainly not any one actor. If asked to name the primary one, I would say Russia, as I was asked earlier, but in general, there are, there are lots of, there, there are as many opportunities as there are users of the internet in, in some respects. What advice would you have, if any, on us dealing with uh, attempts or times or, or scenarios that become prevalent when our so-called allies are actively engaged in presenting misinformation and disinformation? Do you view it as a national security threat when foreign state actors are actively engaged in spreading disinformation and misinformation? That's outside my area of expertise, but I, um, as a citizen uh, worry about how uh, state-sponsored mis- and disinformation with fr from or toward uh, allies or adversaries. Uh, I, I, yeah, I think I, I worry about all of it. And so it's, it's certainly something that, in my view, uh, governments should be talking with each other about and, and um, also uh, 
parliamentarians should be talking with their constituents about. In terms of a risk assessment in national security, uh, how high would you put misinformation and disinformation as being a threat to uh, free and fair elections when it comes to Western democracies? Uh, much higher than it used to be, um, I- at least in the in the United States context. Um, mis- and disinformation on social media platforms has been tied to um, encouraging uh, the January 6th uh, um, uh, atrocities at the United States Capitol uh, as an example of um, how mis- and disinformation about the results of an election uh, can foment political violence. Uh, there's also uh, you know, a high number of uh, mis- and disinformation uh, behaviors that occur around elections, uh, trying to target particular populations, telling them the wrong day uh, for an election, or um, telling them rules about what they have to do uh, when they vote that that aren't accurate, uh, and, and those sorts of things. And so, th- those are all those are all dangers to, to free and fair elections. Mr. Hey. Chair, how much time do I have left? Uh, you're out of time, Mr. Green. Uh, okay. We'll Sorry. Yep. The next round. So that that concludes our first round. We are going to uh, have two five minute rounds and a two and a half minute round, and that'll conclude our first panel. Uh, we want to try to keep it on time here. I'm going to go back to Mr. Caputo for five minutes. Go ahead, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, Mr. Susley. Before I begin, um, this idea of of expertise is an interesting one uh, because sometimes we have, and, and people can chuckle. Uh, but sometimes we have a, uh, oh, okay, I apologize, I, I thought that it was a tuckle to my question. Um, people can have different views on expertise, but in my view, 17 years of real world expertise or real world knowledge is highly beneficial to this committee. So I thank you for being here. Sir, do you fear any repercussions for what you are saying to this committee here? I do. Do you feel fear, I should say? Yeah, I anticipate some kind of uh, punitive response to this. Would you be prepared to let this committee know if there is any sort of response or follow-up from your testimony here today, given that you were invited by parliamentarians and are simply answering questions from parliamentarians truthfully? I have no concern with doing that. I'm going to ask you about gangs in jail and how it's communicated to the public and parliamentarians by the CSC and what's really happening. Do you have any comment on gangs in jail and how that's being communicated and what's really going on? The CSC prides themselves in uh, having successfully successfully eliminated gangs out of Canadian prisons a number of years ago. I believe it was 2014, 2015. Um, That is a celebrated uh, accomplishment amongst the brass of the CSC which was accomplished by changing the name of gangs to security threat groups. I agree. Like, what does that mean? Security threat groups is just, was it simply just a change in the name and therefore we say no gangs exist? Do I have that right? Yes, it was a, it was a name change that, uh, you know, out of one side of the mouth eliminated gangs and on the other hand created a very new problem with a very new, newly named group. Somebody was to testify before Parliament and, and say, you know, gangs are not an issue, but we didn't know this, and we have to say security threat groups are. That's certainly misleading in my view. Um, I want you to talk as well about, we are told that in corrections, there's safe, secure, humane control, and people are, are transferred um, in, con- in consistent, when, when I say transfer, transfer down security from maximum to medium, medium to minimum in accordance with their risk to public safety and things like that. Do you have any comment on that, sir? That's a, uh, a very uh, hot issue amongst correctional officers about what we perceive and believe is the inaccurate um, security classification of inmates being inappropriately downgraded or de yeah, downgraded through security levels without the... Uh, outside of where that inmate is fit to be operating in. When we have a maximum security inmate positioned into a medium or minimum security environment, of course that produces produces all kinds of threats to us and to the public. And is the public, uh, is this type of thing routinely communicated to parliamentarians and the public? It's very rarely communicated to anyone internally. I, I would be shocked if it was communicated externally at all. Um, it's now, usually done through the form of what's called overrides. Overrides, okay. 
what's uh, an override is when a manager essentially says I disagree with what the computer has spit out and I'm going to change that on my own is that that's a kind of crude way of putting it is that accurate essentially um, how much time do I have mr. chair please in minute and 10 seconds okay in a minute and 10 seconds when somebody's incarcerated, there's a perception that this person is, is especially in medium and maximum, but people perceive minimum, which has no fences, that people are behind fences. Are there times where people um, have work clearances or unofficially are escorted out of jails in your experience, contrary to policy, and is that ever communicated? The, absolutely, that happens on an extremely, I would suggest, daily basis in most institutions across the country. You describe, without, without breaching any confidentiality or anything like that, describe a, a scenario that, that is common knowledge to somebody in your industry? We have inmates serving life sentences who are not eligible for any forms of parole but are given gay or fence clearance to work off-site and not out of perimeter during the business day. Communicated to the public or parliamentarians in annual reports or anything like that? No, not communicated anywhere. I assume that's my time, Mr. Chair. It's close to it. Thank you. Um, so when we, we think about different news sources and that uh, they would have different points of view, you know, I'm, I consider myself a well-read person. I, I consume a lot of news. And, and uh, you know, I would think that, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, CNN is considered, what, liberal? Um, Washington Post, I don't know. Uh, CTV, I would have considered conservative, uh, but now apparently it's liberal. Like, how do we identify? Uh, or is that even useful to be identifying uh, different news sources that way? Yeah, it's it's a real challenge, and uh, any way that anyone, including myself, uh, makes those labels is, is open to criticism. So one strategy is to use what we did in that paper, uh, which is a set of scores called the Ferris scores that array uh, news sources based upon uh, the ideological orientation of their users. Uh, and so that is, is one way to measure uh, how... Um, liberal or conservative or centrist a source might be. Another would be to compare the kinds of sources that news organizations quote uh, with the kind of sources that lawmakers of different political parties quote and look for correspondence between those. And so if a newspaper quoted sources that more liberal parliamentarians r refer to in speeches, that might be an example of that paper being more liberal and another, you know, and, and vice versa. Uh, but all, all of these, uh, of course, uh, have their problems. Uh, none of them are infallible. Recommendation uh, before my time is over on uh, what you would consider uh, the most well balanced uh, news sources or credible news sources? I would say uh, often sources uh, that are uh, public sponsored. So, uh, the United States, like National Public Radio and, and Public Television, uh, as an example, the BBC uh, as another. Uh, these are often. Um, high quality news sources. Uh, it's also the case though, uh, you know, that um, any government sponsored source uh, does run the danger of, of um, uh, bias that might uh, favor the government uh, since they are uh, signing the checks. Okay. When, at your next study. Thank you, uh, Ms. Shanahan. For the good and welfare of the people that are watching, uh, because we have had several witnesses appear uh, before this committee in the context of the study to talk about misinformation and disinformation and how it can negatively impact Canadians' trust in public institutions. So the current information ecosystem has been seeing an, an erosion in trust that some people have as well in traditional media. And obviously the same impacts are happening in the States. So have you done research on the impact of misinformation and disinformation on public trust in institutions and traditional media? Yes, but not in, in Canada. What are the main takeaways from the American example that we might be able to learn from? One is that when ideological sources uh, attack the referees, uh, which is to say attack legitimate news sources time and time again, and then... Uh, want to rely upon those sources to fact check things that they care about, they learn quickly that their audience no longer trusts them. And so we've seen very prominent people who've engaged in kind of polarized communication on 
talk radio and and uh, I, uh, cable television in the United States. So distrust in legitimate news sources. And then when a candidate came along of their own party that they didn't like, and they told their audience, we can't trust this person because they lie all the time, their audience said, but you told us not to trust these sources. And, and so when and there just, are no referees, it's very difficult um, to to maintain the, the integrity of a game or the integrity and in, of and in terms of democracy. In terms of ideological uh, ecosystems, we know that in that continuum, it ends in a place of ideologically motivated violent extremism. Uh, we know that in the States, or at least it's been reported, and I'll leave it to you to comment as a subject matter expert, that the two attempts on Donald Trump's life were in fact from ideologically motivated right-wing extremists. Is that not correct? Uh, I'm, I'm confident that at least one of one of those is correct, and I, I believe that the most recent reporting I've seen is, is consistent with your characterization. And so in that space, you quite rightly identify that when this ecosystem of violence, political violence, is unleashed in a world that is absent of fact and completely disassociated from basic civil norms, political violence will impact everybody. Is that a safe assumption to make? It certainly could, and it's the case that individuals feel it in survey research that we do when we ask those who don't participate in politics why they don't uh, – uh, a non-trivial percentage say it's because there are too many dangerous people out there uh, who, you know, are often believing some of the things uh, that you're talking about with respect to things that aren't true that can often lead to uh, political violence. Okay. So in short, that undermines democracy at its foundation if people don't even want to engage because they're afraid of ideologically violent people. You can't have a free and fair election if everyone doesn't feel safe to participate. Okay. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Green. 